All right. Chapter 11 is just the principles of pharmacology. This kind of talks about how drugs are moving throughout the body and different types of information you need to know about all the drugs you're going to come in contact with. We'll get more in-depth to the drugs tomorrow as well as the drug math tomorrow, and then we'll start looking at how to put in IVs and give injections and all that fun stuff. All right? I'm going to go through these objectives. Y'all can read them. You are responsible for administering medications to ill and injured patients. That's a given, right? Mm -hmm. You know that whenever you go on a call, depending on what's wrong with the patient, you have 12 or 13 drugs per your protocol that you're allowed to give these patients. Some medications administered incorrectly can produce life-threatening consequences. That's very important for you to know because when you give any type of drug to a patient, any type of medication, you need to know several different things about it. Why you're giving it, the correct dose you're giving, making sure you know that if they have any contraindications, also knowing side effects, and how long the drug's going to last in the body. And there's all these different materials out there for you to be aware of, such as Hippocrates on your smartphone, or um, Davis Drug Guide, just a physical Davis Drug Guide book, has all your medication information in it. I would suggest either getting one of those books or putting something on your phone or your iPod. Can I just use a Facebook phone now? Uh, Hippocrates. I have no idea how to spell that. I know it's a I was just about Davis. <laughs> H-I-P-P-O-C-R-A-T-E-S. Say that one more time. No, I'm pretty sure it starts with an E. Get a Davis drug guide or something. <laughs> Which most facilities that you go to, they'll have a drug book right there. Like especially in the ER or in respiratory, they kind of carry around a drug book. There's plenty of drug books for you to look at. As I said earlier, you do need to have a, far, a firm understanding of pharmacology. That means of how your drugs work in the body, as well as all the different properties about your medications that you're going to give. What are some initial hypotheses about the cause of the problem? We're going to look at this case study. Somebody turn to the front of the book for me. Not the front of the chapter, sorry. I'm like, why are you looking at the front of the book? We're going to read this case study. You like to read out loud. Like you're back in grammar school. Thanks, Miss Tanner. Advanced EMT, next brand, and mind run, a disregard issue. While inventory is near equipment, they are dispatched to respond to an unknown emergency. En route, dispatch is support an unresponsive woman in a department store parking lot. When they arrive, they find a middle aged woman in the driver's seat of a car who has apparently just stopped in the middle of the parking lot against the parking divider. There is no visible damage to the vehicle, and the airbags have not deployed. She is wearing a seatbelt. The police also approached his mic and tells him that the car was not in a collision but simply rolled to a stop when it struck a curb. There is no one on the scene who knows the patient. Mike approaches the car and determines that the driver has no apparent internal injuries. Her skin is pale, moist, and cool to the touch. She opens her eyes to question but does not respond. A painful stimulus causes her to withdraw and she moves all extremities. Mike determines that her pupils are equal and reactive to light, while Matt obtains baseline vital signs. Vital signs are pulse 120, <coughs> strong and regular, respiration 22, normal, blood pressure 130 over 90, pulse on symmetry 99% at room air, ETCO2 35 mg, and the MMA. Mike finds a prescription bottle of dilatin between the front feet in the car. The medication is prescribed to the patient who has been identified as Shannon Callahan. All right, so what do you think is wrong with this patient? Just from reading that brief little history. What do you know from reading that? Tell me the facts that you know. She wasn't in a car accident. She wasn't in a car accident. Her car just kind of rolled to a stop. Mm -hmm. Moist and cool. What else? Is she responsive? To pain. To pain only, right? Pupils okay? Vital signs good? What is that pill bottle? Dilantin. Do you know what dilantin is? 
All right, if I was to tell you Dilantin was a sugar medication, what would you expect? What's wrong with this patient? Low blood sugar. Low blood sugar. All right, what about to tell you Dilantin was a blood pressure medication? Low blood pressure or high blood pressure. All right, well, Dilantin is actually an anticonvulsant, which means it's a seizure medication. Could have had a seizure. You didn't know anything about seizures? What do you know about seizures? What can do is keep them from getting cut or burned. Keep them from burning as well. As opposed to stay. Yeah. And some are more severe than others. They repeat. Once they come back conscious, oxygen. Okay. What kind of phase is she in? Post. Post phase, right? So it sounds to me like she's had a seizure. And she had a seizure while she was driving. There's people who have seizures while they're driving because they don't have a driver's license. Um, what about her medication? Do you think she's taken her medication? Probably not. Probably not. She's a seizure patient and she's got seizure medication next to her and she's done had a seizure. More than likely she's not taking her medication. Or if she is taking it, she's not taking it at the proper dosages. All right. What initial steps in management should you take to finish your assessment on this type of patient? You've already got their vital signs. What other information do you need to try to gather? See if they got a vital mask or bracelet. Medical alert bracelets, things like that? Okay. Check for any other medications laying around. Also look at the patient and check her up head to toe. Make sure she doesn't have any type of injuries anywhere. You don't obviously see anything. She obviously hasn't been in a car wreck. But you also need to think about possible overdose. Anytime I find a patient unresponsive, you need to make sure that you look at everything. Not just focus in on one thing. You get that tunnel vision, especially if you see a bottle of dilant, you say, oh, she's had a seizure. She's not taking her medicine correctly. Well, actually, her husband just told her he wanted a divorce, and she just shot up a bunch of cocaine and decided to go driving. Or snort. I don't know what you do with cocaine. Um, <laughs> and she just overdosed. Her heart just stopped. Of course, you got vital signs, and they're great, but <laughs> that's my point, though, is you need to make sure that you look at everything. Don't just get that tunnel vision on one thing. You need to make sure you check your patient out head to toe to make sure you know that what's wrong with this thing. Did you do that? Yes. Oh, okay. As I say, I didn't do that. What? you got to teach me how you did that, because I tried to do that on another one, and it wouldn't work. All right, so what are the four basic sources of drug medication? Animals, synthetics, and herbs. <laughs> <laughs> Plant, animals, minerals, and synthetic. Insulin is a drug that's used a lot for blood sugar. A lot of type 1 diabetic patients take insulin injections to help lower their blood sugar. And it's made from pigs. I thought it was always pretty interesting. It's made from pigs. You can have synthetic drugs made in the laboratory. They can be made from all types of minerals, plants. Morphine is made from the opioid plant or opium plant. Discovered in 1921, insulin has been saved the lives of 15 million people with diabetes, and I've already told you that it's derived from the pancreas of pigs, also from cows. We're going to go over a little bit of legislation here in just a few minutes, but as I told you earlier, your PDR, such as your Davis Drug Guide or your Hippocrates for your phones, are really good references for you to have, especially when you're in the emergency room, because you're going to be given all different kinds of drugs. Now, on the ambulance, you're going to stick with those 12 drugs that's in your protocol. Then the ER, labor and delivery, or respiratory, you're going to give a variety, just a complete variety of drugs. So make sure you have something there that you can look at, whether it be a Davis Drug Guide or Hippocrates. Before administering any drug, you must know basic information about it. Keep current with new um, information. There are many different printed electronic sources out there. We've already discussed those. And we're going to go through each topic of drugs, or excuse me, each classification of drugs, as well as all the information I want you to know about all your drugs. And when we get done, you do have an assignment that I need you to be working on. You're going to make drug cards that have all the drugs that you're allowed to give. Um, Nick has made a assignment sheet with everything on it for you so that you can see that. That's due on the 17th of October. So that's something you need to be working on probably fairly quickly. The more you know your drugs, then the better off you are, especially when it comes to test taking time. Drugs have four different names, and I don't know why I didn't say. Um, you have a generic name, a trade name, a chemical name, and an official name. There's four different names. 
I had this on last night. I don't know why it didn't save. My computer's been freezing up on me all day, so I don't know what's wrong with it. Your generic name and your trade name are the most common that you'll see. Ibuprofen is a generic name. You might have a trade name for ibuprofen is? Motrin. Your generic name is ibuprofen. Your trade name is what the pharmaceutical company gives that drug. Motrin. Ibuprofen can be, um, you'll feel a lot of times that it just say ibuprofen, especially whenever you're talking about giving medication to infants or kids over six months of age. Dr. Chase just gave them some ibuprofen. I remember the first time my husband had to give us ibuprofen. He called me. He said, we don't have any ibuprofen. All we have is Motrin. <laughs> like, look on the bottle. It will say ibuprofen because it has, usually has both those names on there. There's also uh, Tylenol. Tylenol is a trade name. It's a name given to it by the pharmaceutical company. The generic name for Tylenol is acetaminophen. A little known fact for you. Um, generic names are always lowercase. Trade names are always uppercase. That's just a little tidbit for you to know. Your chemical name is the chemical composition of that drug. And we'll show you an example here in just a few minutes. And the official name is just the um, generic name with USP out beside it. And I'll show you what that means here in just a few minutes, too. You also need to know what kind of classification drugs are, where they work on the body. What their mechanism of action is, meaning what do they do to the body. If I'm going to give somebody aspirin, then I need to know what aspirin does to the body. What does aspirin do to the body? What does it do to your blood? Do you know? It brings it, brings it out. I've already talked about mechanism of action. Indication. What does indication mean? Why you're going to give it to somebody. Why would I give somebody aspirin? Pain. People having a heart attack. You also need to know how pharmacokinetics work. And this means how your body metabolizes, or excuse me, how it absorbs, metabolizes, and excretes the medication from the body. And we'll go into a little bit more in depth with those in just a few minutes. You also need to know side effects. The side effects of your drugs are anything from headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation. These are unintended effects. I don't give you aspirin for chest pain knowing that I'm going to make you vomit or have diarrhea. I just know that that's a potential side effect and I warn you that, you know, Miss Tammy, I'm going to give you some aspirin for your chest pain, but just know that aspirin can sometimes make you have an upset stomach. It can make you a little nauseated. Okay? That one's sorry. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a side effect and an allergic reaction? Side effects. They're not really common, but I mean, I guess they're more common, but they're not going to kill you. Allergic reactions can kill you. That's true. Allergic reactions can kill you. Most of the time, your allergic reactions are going to be signs and symptoms of hives or um, decrease. Your immune system is going to be involved in the allergic reaction. Right, your immune system is involved where it is not with side effects. You're going to have difficulty breathing. You can have a constricted airway. Usually it has to do with the fact that your body can't tolerate that medication. And it's telling your body that, you know, I can't tolerate this. We need to try to do something to get it out. Side effects are just common. They do happen with some medications, just like aspirin. A lot of people that take aspirin can wind up having ulcers or having a lot of gastric irritation. Have a lot of uh, nausea and sometimes a lot of abdominal pain. The route of administration is also very important. We'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into absorption, but how you give your medication. There's all different ways. You can give it by mouth, which is known as PO. That just means you're going to swallow it with a glass of water. Then you have your sublingual, which means it goes in front of your tongue, which is your nitroglycerin tablets. Then you have your IV drugs. You have your IM drugs, which are intramuscular, which go into the muscle or the arm or the buttock area, your thigh. 
You also have your sub Q. Would you like your epinephrine? If you have somebody who's got an allergic reaction, you need to give them some epinephrine. You can typically get it sub Q or intramuscular. The sub Q just means the little fatty part on the arm or the stomach, the low handle area. You also have intranasal drugs like Narcan. Narcan is one of your drugs that you'll see tomorrow. It's an opioid um, antagonist. And you can give it intranasally. You also have transdermal drugs like um, nitroglycerin patches. You'll see patients who have heart issues and coronary issues, they will have nitroglycerin patches on. You also need to know contraindications of drugs. One drug that you're going to see a lot given in the emergency room that's on your protocol is Tordol. Tordol is anti-inflammatory. Basically, it's just souped up Motrin given IV. But the biggest contraindication for Tordol is pregnancy. You cannot give Tordol to a pregnant woman. It's considered a category X, which we'll talk about. I'll get from this lecture. Yeah, it's in this one. I'll work tomorrow. <coughs> so know your contraindications. Just like nitroglycerin, you can't give nitroglycerin to a patient if their blood pressure is low. If they have a systolic blood pressure of 90, you give them a vasodilator, it's going to rob their blood pressure out even more, right? You also need to know the correct dose. If you look in your book at your drugs that are in chapter 13, for example, epinephrine, you give it for an allergic reaction, it tells you to give 0.3 or 0.5. Your protocol, Alabama protocol, will tell you 0.3. Just because the drug book tells you 0.3 to 0.5, you don't just go give 0.5 because that's just what you want to get. You have to get what your protocols say to make sure you know the correct dosage. <clears throat> you also need to know how it's supplied. Epinephrine is one of those drugs that comes in a pre filled syringe. Or you'll have a vial of Benadryl or diphenhydramine, is a generic name. Benadryl is a trade name. The vial itself will say you've got 50 milligrams and 2 milliliters. I'll teach you tomorrow how to find concentration. So then make sure you know the concentration of the vial. Special considerations or precautions to be observed when administering a special drug. Nitroglycerin is one of those drugs that you have to monitor blood pressure every five minutes when you're giving it. Because it can block, drop your blood pressure very quickly. Everybody good so far? Can I stand up and do some jumping jacks? You're cold? No? It's warming up in here to me. It was cold a while ago. Here's an example of normal saline. What class is it? Classification. Isotonic crystalloid. All right. What's the uh, mechanism of action? What's it used for? What's that mean? Use more, more fluid, right? If you're hypovolemic because you've been nausea and vomiting and having diarrhea for the past three days, you don't have a lot of fluid circulating in your body, correct? Give you some normal saline, you're going to feel like a new person. So you have a little bit more volume. All right? Indicated for hypovolemia, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, or diabetic ketoacidosis. These are all people that have lost a lot of fluid. They need a fluid replacement. All right, why is it come? What's it contraindicated in? Why? Because your body already holds so much fluid, you're just adding more fluid to it. And what are you going to do to the heart? You're going to cause it to stop. Overload it. Way too much. All right, what are some precautions you need to worry about? Fluid, fluid overload. Same thing with your congestive heart failure patients. What are some side effects? What's that mean? Water and down your blood too much, which is going to cause an off balance in your electrolytes, right? All right. Dosage really just depends on what's being given. For adult patients and your pediatric patients, it's 20 milliliters per kilogram fluid bolus. And for infants, it's 10 milliliters per kilogram. I'm going to write that down just FYI. <laughs> pediatric and adult patients, fluid dosages for a fluid bolus is 20 milliliters per kilogram. Infants is 10 milliliters per kilogram.
Can you give normal saline by mouth? No. Like drinking salt water would be nasty. How is it supplied? How do you give it? How do you, what route is it, I guess I should say? Sorry. Always IV. You can't give it sub-Q. You can't give it IN. You can't give it PO. You can't give it sublingual. Everything's all, normal saline is always IV. It's supplied in different types of bags, and we'll show you some bags when we go to the lab either this afternoon or tomorrow. It's supplied in 250 milliliter bags, 500 or 1,000. You may also be responsible for giving some over-the-counter medications, such as Tylenol. And we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. Even though they are over-the-counter medications, they still um, may be used only as directed by your protocol. So if your protocol tells you to give 500 milligrams of Tylenol for a fever, you're not going to go give 1,000. You're going to follow your protocols. If you're reading your book, you do have some legislation things to look at and kind of overview. Read some of those. Um, the biggest thing is, is that pharmaceutical manufacturers adhere to laws and regulations that protect you as a consumer. And about years ago, people could just walk up to a doctor and ask for some morphine, and they'd give up all the morphine. It was nothing to get drugs. Now, according to the FDA and the Controlled Substance Act, everything has to be labeled, has to be labeled with side effects, the correct dosage, the correct name. And licensed physicians are the only one that can prescribe narcotics. So all this has evolved over the past year. So there's some information you can read about in your book. I talked about that. Not to just bore you guys, but seriously, read over the legislation in your book. It's not very in depth, but it's actually less in depth in this book than it was in the last one that we had. Your other kind of medications are issued without a prescription. Y'all know that. Prescription type drugs are your blood pressure medications, your heart medications, any type of narcotic medications, medications for diabetes, asthma. What are some common over-the-counter drugs that you see? Hmm? Tylenol, Advil. Cold medicine. Cold medicine. I was about to say Sudafed, but you can't even really get that much over the counter anymore without giving away your half your life to get a bottle of Sudafed. When you administer medication to a patient according to protocol, you are doing so under direct order by your medical director, which means the medication is being prescribed to the patient by the medical director. Even though the physician is prescribing the medication, he's doing so based on your assessment of the patient. If you call medical direction and you say, I've got a patient who um, is having an allergic reaction to some peanuts and protocol states to give them 0.3 milligrams of epi sub q. I've already done that, they're not getting any better. Calling for further orders, they tell you to give another 0.3. You know, they're telling you to do medication administration based on your assessment of the patient. They're your eyes and ears. But y'all already knew that, right? The Controlled Substance Act, I think of 1970 puts controlled substances in special schedules, different categories. You have schedules one through five. These are listed in your book. Schedule one has a high abuse potential. This is heroin, LSD. They have no recognized medical use. They are of no good to anyone. High abuse potential. I would suggest you know all these schedules as well. Schedule two, have a high potential for abuse and also have a recognized medical use in the United States. Morphine, codeine, hydrocodone. These all are used medically but also have a very high abuse potential. Schedule three, they have a less high abuse potential than schedule two but still also have acceptable medical uses. These are like your Tylenol number threes. These are over-the-counter medications that are mixed with some narcotic type medications, like your Tylenol number threes that are mixed with codeine. And you have Schedule Four. Of course, they have a less abuse potential than Schedule Three. 
These are your benzodiazepines, different types of stimulants. And then your Schedule 5 have a very low abuse potential. These are the over-the-counter medications for cough and also your antidiarrheal medications. Why people get addicted to cough syrup, I'm not quite sure of, but it's kind of silly that it's considered a controlled substance. Cough syrup? Mm -hmm. Well, I knew they used Sudafed, but I didn't know they used cough syrup, too. Mm -hmm. They usually just get the peel boxes, the Sudafed peels, and use those, I thought, I don't know. Did you do that inside? Yeah. That's how you know so much about it. I don't think any of us. No, I, don't, I, thought, I just thought that anything that had the Sudafed would be. Well, I think they're talking about. With the controlled substances, they're talking about uh, cough medicines that have codeine in them. Pain medication. Or this other person. This one here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm talking about now. Sit the bed. Okay. I'll say that I think that it's talking about coding. It's uh, cough medicine with coding. Cough medicines with coding. The FDA also regulates medications by putting it through different types of testing. They do first start off with animal testing, then they move on to human testing and placebo type group. Just know a little bit about FDA. Read in your book about your legislation and talk about that talks about FDA and what it does. The main thing that FDA does is make sure that what the manufacturers are putting out there to you is not harmful. You also have special considerations. As I told you earlier, Toradol is a medication we give a lot in the emergency room for pain. You cannot give it to pregnant patients. It has tetragenic effects, which means it's very harmful to the fetus. A lot of pregnant women <coughs> have to be very careful with any type of medication they take. Like a friend of mine, she was uh, found out she was pregnant and had to quit taking her medication. She took for o a OCD, is that what it's called? OCD? Yeah. Um, because it was had tetragenic effects. It was considered a category X. And we'll talk about the pregnancy categories here in just a few minutes and see a little more what I'm talking about. We have A, B, C, D, and X. The category A, studies have not identified a risk to the fetus during pregnancy. So that medication is considered safe for pregnant women to take. And you definitely would rather them test on animals before they start testing on humans. Yeah. Um, category B, animal studies have not identified a risk to the fetus, but there are no adequate human studies. So in animal studies, there's no harm to the fetus. There's not enough adequate information in a human study to say whether or not it's okay or not okay. This is kind of your benefit outweighs your risk. Like if I was going to give um, a pregnant female patient was in cardiac arrest and I needed to give her some atropine, then if it was a category B, giving her the atropine might bring her back to life. You never know. Might start getting her heart working again. And that would be my benefit outweigh my risk. Does that make sense? Or if I was going to give her an epinephrine, I can't remember what epinephrine is. If it was a category B, I think epinephrine is actually a category C. But then if she would have an allergic reaction, my benefit would outweigh my risk. Same thing with 
Category C. Animal studies have demonstrated adverse effects, but there's not enough adequate studies in humans. This is also a little teeter-totter. Does your benefit outweigh your risk? Category D, there is evidence to show that there is harmful effects to the fetus. But if your benefit outweighs your risk, then the patient still needs to get that medication. And then your category X, there are tremendous risks to the fetus. The risk outweighs any potential benefit to the mother. There's no reason to take any medication as a category X. Any questions on pregnancy categories? This is a special consideration you make sure you know of whenever you're making your drug cards. Is that one of the things on there, Nick? I didn't even see it. What? On the drug cards, pregnancy category. Category. Uh, it's not on there. But I would suggest you know them. Make sure you write down what the pregnancy categories are. Then you have your pediatric patient. Pediatric patients, little people, are little adults. Did you remember that from my lecture? Pediatric patients are not little adults. Their bodies do work a lot differently than ours do. So, of course, they're going to take medications a lot differently than we do. Their metabolism is a lot faster, so they might use the medication a lot quicker in the body and eliminate it a lot faster, so they might have a shorter half-life, a shorter time of medication in the body. Your pediatric doses are, is always on based on weight. You seen that Broslo tape? Have you seen Broslo tape at all? The practice thing that we have, uh, we never talked about it. Okay. Nick, do we have Broslo tape here? I know we have some at Salaka somewhere. Y'all need to see that. Mm -hmm. And it puts them in those, cut that color category, whether it be pink, gray, purple, brown, blue. Yeah, it's based on their weight. It tells you all the different drugs they can give. We need to bring some of that. Y'all just remind me to get some. I know we've got one in Ephelica somewhere. We've also had the PD wheel. It's a um, pediatric wheel that you can just dial it to where their weight is or what you estimate their weight is, and it tells you all the kind of medications they can have and what the dosages are. It's usually life-threatening illnesses, those kind of medications, like epinephrine, atropine. You use it a lot more when you get into paramedic. Your geriatric patients are also considered a special population. Their bodies don't work nearly as good as ours do either. They don't absorb as quickly. They don't metabolize as quickly. They do not eliminate as quickly. They hold on to medication a lot more than what we do. Another thing with your geriatric patients, they're usually taking a lot of medication. Hang on, I met one woman one time. She's 100 years old. She came in for something, a bee sting or something, something just random. And she was not taking any medication. She was 100 years old. I wouldn't have put her a day over 70. She looked great. But she wouldn't take any medication at all. No aspirin, no nothing. I was very shocked by that. Most of your geriatric patients take about a handful of pills every day. And the problem they run into is their memory loss. They forget. Did I take my blood pressure medicine today? Well, I don't know. So let me take it again. And then they call, their family calls because their blood pressure is low and they're not um, comprehensive. They're not arousing enough. Or they think they took their medication and they forget and they didn't take their sugar medication, then you're getting called because they're in diabetic ketoacidosis. Mm 